Now, if that song punches you in the heart the same way it does to me, you sound like my kind of person. And if it doesn't, kill yourself. I'm just joking, do it. That is part of a piece of music entitled Concerning Hobbits, or the Shire music. But of course, you knew this because you're a person of great taste, a person of great culture, a person who probably at one point in their lives was mercilessly bullied at school for looking like one of the titular characters. Wait, wait, no, that was just me. Um, <laughs> I'm fine about it, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Simply put, we will not see a movie or series of movies like the Peter Jackson trilogy ever again. And it is with a heavy heart that I can quite confidently make that claim. Hell, even Peter Jackson, couldn't remake the Peter Jackson trilogy. So why is that? Well, thank you for asking, even though you didn't. I asked myself and then I wrote this video, but shut up and allow me to spend insert amount of time here explaining why that is. With the rise of technology, particularly CGI and the current climate of entertainment, movies like the Jackson trilogy are like the Latin language. They might have built the groundwork for and influenced almost everything that came after, but it is ultimately unsustainable. To have movies made like the Lord of the Rings trilogy again, you would have to not only find a studio willing to pay for such a project, and you know, the kind of money we're talking, this means only the biggest studios in the world. Even if by some miracle you find this hypothetical studio, you then have to convince said company to spend more than is technically necessary to execute the feature. And let me just remind you that major studios these days are reluctant to fund anything that isn't a sequel, prequel, or spin-off. And even then, they keep a tight grip on the reserves. So before you've even begun filming, that project is dead in the water. Contemporary movie making culture simply will not accommodate for it. If you account for inflation, the budget of the Peter Jackson trilogy today would be around the half a billion mark. And let's not forget that at the time of the release of the Peter Jackson trilogy, The Lord of the Rings was, I mean, it was big in the world of literature, certainly, but in terms of Hollywood, in terms of the big silver screen, not so much. Sure, there was the 1977 Hobbit animation, though I wouldn't exactly call that big budget cinema. So once again, good luck convincing a studio to spend half a billion on an adaptation that's not yet been adapted for the silver screen in any way. And it's not just a financial problem. The rise of CGI is nothing short of a marvel. You know, not, not that kind of marvel. But what computers and CG artists are capable of today is nothing short of incredible. But unfortunately, it's also put a nail in the coffin for films like the trilogy ever being made again. Though CGI was available, used, and pioneered in the production of the Jackson trilogy, it had much higher limitations and was far less capable. And as a result, the vast majority of these movies were shot practically. And thank God for that, because one of the weaker elements of these movies 20 years later is the CGI. But with what you can achieve with CGI today, good luck convincing a studio to film anything practical. I'm surprised they still let real life actors on set. I'm surprised they still have real life sets. Wait, no, Star Wars got rid of those, didn't they? Yeah, just wonderful. Yeah, thanks to the volume, audiences don't ever have to worry about looking at a real life tree ever again. Oh, this is fun. Back in the day, they'd embellish a movie with little bits of CGI, just to add a bit of polish, just to fill in the gaps. Nowadays, it feels like they're embellishing CGI with a little bit of movie. It's, it, it's gone too far the other way. It seems that studios have begun to forget about phrases like long-term investment or creative risk. They just want quick, guaranteed numbers. And so that means looking at the last okay product that they made and sticking a number two on it. And you know what? That's fair enough. They wanna do that, they have every right. It ain't my company. But at their own risk, movie studios have begun to forget about their obligations to the art form itself, movie making, that without, they wouldn't have a penny. Disney in particular has mastered the art of fast food movies. These things, you know, they might not have any real substance to them, but they're cheap, they're quick, and they're easy. And the problem with that is, People really like fast food. This is art. This is art. This is fast food. This is art. This is art. This is fast food. Now you might have seen my review of the, frankly visionary, uh, live action reimagining of The Little Mermaid. Sometimes you get those productions where everything just comes together right. Each piece just falls into place and you end up with a masterpiece. You catch lightning in a bottle. This is, Whatever the opposite of that is, they caught poop in a bottle. Every single piece of this movie was weak. 
But if I may bring it back to Lord of the Rings, there is no proverbial poop to be found in any proverbial bottle here. No, the Lord of the Rings belongs to the aforementioned. Every single piece of this movie delivered. And with the size of a production like the Lord of the Rings trilogy, there is an element of chance that comes into pulling something like that off. Thousands of people have to execute their roles to a high standard for a number of years, and no amount of direction and oversight can guarantee that. It certainly helps, sure, but it makes no guarantee. But let's take a look at some of the tangible elements that went into making this trilogy a masterpiece, starting with the music. And these movies have incredibly diverse and dynamic soundtracks that touch each and every human emotion at one point or another. You can find heartwarming joy and a strong sense of home within the sounds of the Shire. The Fellowship themes are epic and beck an adventure, while Rivendell and Lothlorien echo somber. Enigmatic tones and the themes following the Ringwraiths denote a sense of fear unlike any other soundtrack I've ever heard, just to name a few. In fact, I'm almost certain that the sound and look of the Ring Wraiths was one of the key inspirations for the entire Souls-like game genre. Now, my favourite music from the trilogy can be found within Rohan. A touch I'm particularly fond of is the use of bowed instruments within the themes of the Rohirrim. Obviously, Rohan, home of the Horse Lords, known for its horse riders. What are bows typically made out of? Horsehair! This is big brain stuff, people. And it's also a small space to be playing the cello. Do forgive me. Just to prove a point, remove the horsehair from the equation, and all of a sudden, it starts to sound a little less Rohan, and a little more... Yeah, man. See what I mean? Little details, little touches like that, that almost no one would ever think of or pick up on, but were thought of and were implemented and made for a better sound. The Lord of the Rings soundtrack has found itself a place within a category that historically has been reserved for classic video games, the likes of Ocarina of Time, Final Fantasy VII, even more modern entries like Undertale. And that is when an original soundtrack manages to transcend its already legendary host, and people who have not consumed the original product are aware of the soundtrack, in some cases in its entirety. You might not have played Ocarina of Time, you might not even know what it is, you weird little freak, but I'm almost certain you've heard the Lost Woods theme. Or the windmill theme. And it's the same with Undertale. You might not have played it, you might not have even heard of it, but I'm sure you've heard the shop theme. And if not that, then you've definitely heard Megalovania. This is a category reserved mostly for video games, because you typically spend more time with a video game than you do watching a movie. It's rare that someone spends 100 plus hours watching the same film. In the world of gaming though, 100 plus hours, those are rookie numbers. So as you typically spend more time with a video game than you do watching a movie, you become much more accustomed to its soundtrack. The more time you spend with something, the more likely you are to develop a stronger affinity towards that thing. Propinquity and all that. And it's the same story with The Lord of the Rings. It's a tradition within the fandom to rewatch the trilogy at least once every year. So it's very common for a Lord of the Rings fan to have spent 100 plus hours watching the trilogy. And so it joins the likes of video game titans. Here's an experiment to test that theory. Try it out with someone that you know that's not watched Lord of the Rings, if you happen to know one of those unusual little people. But play them something from The Lord of the Rings. Don't tell them what it is or what it's from. Play them something like the prologue theme. And I guarantee almost every one of them will have heard it before, and some of them might even be able to tell you what it's from without even having seen the movie. It is, uh, it is truly a remarkable body of work. Now let's talk about Alan Lee and John Howe, and what can I say about these two shining bastions of gentlemen. Before working on the trilogy, they were both renowned Tolkien illustrators. Alan Lee is a reclusive British artist who was responsible for inspiring Peter Jackson's earliest visions of the trilogy, and John Howe is an incredible Canadian artist that, if you don't know him from Lord of the Rings, you might know him from the likes of Magic the Gathering or even the Game of Thrones universe. And they both acted as conceptual designers for the Jackson trilogy, along with Wet Workshop, they were responsible for the way the movies look, essentially. Unfortunately, we do have to keep it somewhat brief. I could easily sit here and talk about just Alan and John and all the work that they put into the trilogy, but like I say, for the sake of a YouTube video, we press on. But one fact that blows my mind is that no pre-existing props were used in any way, in any scene, in any movie. Every single barrel, every single pipe, 
candlestick, wheelbarrow, cup, fork, bookcase, everything you see on screen was designed and handmade from scratch exclusively for these movies. And it goes even deeper than that, because at times they had to shoot at two different scales because of the hobbits. So a large number of these props were not only handmade, but handmade to scale in two different sizes. And of course it goes even deeper than that because some of the sets, like the Prancing Pony for example, were also recreated in two different scales. I'm still yet to come across that level of care and attention to detail in almost any other movie. Like, it's not even close. Another thing this movie should be praised for is the fact that many noted Tolkien scholars were consulted throughout the production of these three movies, including the real life Maillard that is Tom Shippey. And if you don't know who this man is, he is to Tolkien what Jesus was to God. Fortunately, Mr. Shippey is yet to have been crucified, but believe me, I'm sure that the makers of the Rings of Power gave it a pretty good go. Remember when they sacked him? That's right, Rings of Power got rid of Tom Shippey. Hmm, I can't possibly imagine why. They got rid of someone who was considered to be not only a stand-up guy, but one of the most learned individuals when it comes to anything Tolkien. They looked at Tom Shippey and they said, you know what? I just don't think you're right for this Lord of the Rings production. You don't know what you're talking about. Of course, we all know that he committed the heinous crime of knowing what he's talking about. And how did that go for you, Amazon? Hey, <laughs> how's that billion dollar show doing? <laughs> Come on, you didn't think I'd talk about Lord of the Rings and not use this as an excuse to send a few shots Amazon's way. Come on, it's like you don't even know me. But enough circle jerking, let's actually watch the movies and break down what it is that makes them so iconic. And of course, there is only one version to rule them all, and that is, of course, the extended cuts. Why, do I look like some sort of rookie to you? Come on, do I? Well, according to the boxes, the extended editions clock in at a total runtime of 700 and 26 minutes for any of you mathematicians out there. That is approximately 12 straight hours of pornography. Let's get watching. Now the fellowship kicks off with the fastidious prologue in which they did a pretty good job of condensing almost 2000 years worth of lore into some key events from the second age that will help to contextualize some of the events within the Jackson trilogy. For those of you that don't know, the Lord of the Rings sits right towards the end of the known Tolkien timeline. And of course there is a few thousand years worth of lore precursing this, some of which that were masterfully portrayed in Amazon's show, The Rings of Power. Except, of course, I'm lying. And that show was so cataclysmically awful, it gave me a career on YouTube. That's how bad it was. Beard. No! This cannot be Elrond, can it? I fear so. Anyway, back to the prologue. And what is a great example of an interesting way to exposition dump? Because, let's face it, that's essentially what this is. The prologue is, here's a bunch of information. Enjoy the next 12 hours. Oh boy, and do I love that shot when the arrow goes sailing past Elrond and you get that subtle little flinch. Ah, do you remember when Elrond used to be a badass battle commander? Herald of Gilgalad. And now he just, uh, he just writes poetry, sits in trees. That's really cool, thanks Amazon. <clears throat> Sorry, I will attempt to stop mentioning the Rings of Power. <laughs> but I'm making no promises. It was a clever addition to have Galadriel be the one to narrate the prologue. Some people might wonder why it is that it wasn't someone like Frodo. For example, after all, is he not one of the, if not the, titular character? Why not have Frodo do it? Well, the fact is, Frodo wouldn't be, along with many other characters, wouldn't be privy to the information found within the prologue. So, for the sake of continuity, it wouldn't necessarily make sense for Frodo to be the one to do it. Galadriel, however, in all her agelessness and wisdom, she has been around for a few thousand years, let's not forget, makes for a much more suitable candidate. It also helps that Kate Blanchett has killer delivery. Unlike another Galadriel, in a show that I, I shall not mention again, <clears throat> Rings of Power. And then of course there's Hobbiton, which is the first of many practical sets, and they spent a whole year building the entire town of Hobbiton before they even began shooting any of the movies, which is a gargantuan amount of work to put into what ended up being actually very little screen time. But it speaks to the ethos of the movies. No corners were cut, they persisted down the path of most resistance for the sake of us, the audience and God bless those Kiwis for doing it. Of course, I could talk about all the work that went into practical effects like the use of forced perspective, which is fantastic. But the thing is, I feel like most fans know about this kind of stuff. So I'm gonna try and pick up on things that aren't mentioned quite as much, or maybe even things that some fans don't even know. Maybe like this. Fun fact, did you know that the voice of the Black Rider is Andy Serkis, who is also known for playing the role of Gollum, and the Nazgul screams were performed by one of the writers, Philippa Boyens? True story. Now tell me that fact wasn't fun. Go ahead. Tell me. 
One aspect of the box that they just couldn't maintain within the movies was time frames. For example, in the book, it's more than 15 years between Gandalf leaving for Gondor, learning of the nature of the ring, and then returning to Hobbiton and to warn Frodo. Of course, in the movies, this was represented in a much shorter time frame, a matter of months, maybe even weeks, and it's little changes like this that did rustle a few fans' jimmies, but it makes complete sense to me, because they've only got a limited amount of runtime. About 12 hours, sure, but that's still not a whole lot of time to pack so much story into. You know, you can disagree with the changes that they made, that's fine, but changes had to be made regardless. That, that's just the way it is. I did want to briefly defend that point. Also, concerning the extended cuts, there were no major pivotal plot changing scenes removed from the theatrical releases. You can watch the theatrical cuts and understand what's happening. But in the extended cuts, we get an additional I think it's about two and a half hours or so, of further character and world building, particularly with the likes of characters like Aragorn and the Hobbits. So think of the extended cuts as the seasoned version of the original dish. They haven't changed the recipe, the flavour just has a bit more depth to it. And unless time is an issue for you, there really is no reason not to watch the extended cuts. And let's face it, if time is an issue, you're not watching the Lord of the Rings trilogy, are you? Of course, we couldn't talk about the Jackson trilogy without mentioning miniatures, or bigatures, as they were called on set, as some of these so-called miniatures took up entire parking lots. Most structures that you see in this movie, if not a full-size set, is usually a miniature. And it's a pretty cool concept, really. Rather than build a full-size set, build it a smaller scale and film that. You get a great practical shot while saving money and time. And the truth is, I actually quite like the look of miniature shots. They have this childlike toy box look to them that's actually quite charming. Another great example of this movie's ethos and dedication to respect and sensitivity is the scene when Saruman has all of the trees pulled down to fuel his war machine. One of the main themes within The Lord of the Rings is industry destroying nature. So Tolkien would have been more than a little perturbed by the notion of pulling down real trees for the sake of a shot in a movie. So in this scene, for example, they buried an artificial tree and yanked that back down. Very respectful. And we then arrive at Rivendell. And this scene is one of my favourites from The Fellowship, as one, it's our first sachet into a slightly more fantastical location. So far we've been to Hobbiton and Bree, and although charming, they're definitely more grounded in reality, particularly for an English boy like myself. This part of the trilogy in Rivendell was supposedly one of the hardest to script due to pacing issues. They didn't want the movies to come to a grinding halt before they'd even really got going, but the fact is I think they did a great job. Not only does it act as a much-needed respite for the characters and maybe even the audience, but it galvanises momentum for, well, the entire trilogy, really. For a first-time watcher, this feels like a conclusion. You know, we've been on this grand journey, faced many perils, and now the ring is safe in Rivendell. And they all lived happily ever after. Except, of course, we know this is not the case, and the preceding events are about to be dwarfed by the magnitude of the real journey ahead. It's a bit like when you leave Midgar for the first time in Final Fantasy VII, and you're like, man, what, what a journey. That, what a re that was a really great game. Only to remember, wait, hang on, there's, there's another two discs, and I've, I've, not even, I've not even met this Sephiroth bloke yet, so... Uh, this, this can't be the end. And you realise that the whole journey that you've been on so far has just been the introduction. And the world has opened up and the real story has begun. It helps the audience to contextualise the sheer scale of the journey that the Fellowship are about to undertake. If you thought this was big, what do you think about this? Kind of thing. With movie runtimes, they don't have the luxury of slowly and delicately laying out each and every single detail like the box can. So this scene acts as a springboard that helps to paint a similar picture within a much shorter time frame. And of course, we couldn't not mention everyone's favourite jump scare. Ah! Legitimately terrified me as a child, and still does to this day. There's no joke there, I'm just a little baby bitch boy. And of course, I could not mention one of the uh, greatest pieces of writing from the box and uh, dialogue from the movies. <clears throat> I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Frodo. So do I, said Gandalf. And so do all who live to see such times. But it is not for them to decide. All that we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. You know, there's not a whole lot I can say about that other than what a wonderful way of condensing more than a thousand pages worth of writing. For me, that is not only one of my favourite lines, but it, it, it perfectly encapsulates the feeling of the three movies in one line. I tell you what, that, that Tolkien bloke wasn't bad at writing, was he? Hey? Hey? Now, I know that there are some fans out there that object to some of the, um, the comic relief that can be found within these movies. Nobody tosses a dwarf. No! 
Come in! And though I understand where they're coming from, for me, it's an important inclusion, as every great story has a little bit of everything. Happiness, despair, humour. Uh, that's because life does. And I think to remove humour from the movies would be to remove uh, an element of humanity from them as well. Was it taken a bit too far at times? That could be argued. And can the concept of adding humour to a slightly more serious tale be taken too far? Certainly. Just look at, I don't know, every Marvel movie ever made. I think a lot of people get angry when an adaptation is changed when compared to its source material. I've seen many a comments when talking about the Peter Jackson trilogy saying something along the lines of, why didn't they just make a one-to-one -one copy of the box? Why change anything? But going from book to screenplay, things have to change. We're talking about two different mediums here, two different ways of writing, two different ways of telling a story. And like I mentioned, two very different timescales. The Jackson trilogy changed all kinds of things. They took things out, added bits in, swap bits around, took quotes from one character, gave them to another, but these movies are still considered to be one of the most respectful adaptations ever made, period. And that's because the problem we so often see today is not necessarily the writers changing the source material, it's when writers lack respect and understanding of the source material. That is the real issue, it's intention. When I sit here and I watch the Peter Jackson trilogy, at no point, and I sat there thinking, oh, they, they just did it for the profit. They sat there like, ooh, let's get some of that Tolkien money. No. I sit there thinking, oh, you know what? Yeah, I, it, it would appear that they care about Tolkien. They care about what Tolkien wrote. And most importantly for us, they cared about making a good movie. Something worth watching. Something worth your time. About 12 hours of it. Anyway, on to The Two Towers, which, if pushed, I would say is my favourite movie from the trilogy. And let's just start by talking about the Orc and Urukai prosthetics. These guys look incredible, even by today's standards. And it's not only thanks to Weta Workshop's incredible work, but it's the fact it's practical. When you compare these guys to, I don't know, someone like Gollum, for example, no guess is which one didn't age quite so well as the other. Granted, motion capture might have been the best way to go for a character like Gollum, particularly considering his unusual proportions, but can you imagine how good he would have looked if they did manage to create that character practically? And other than a handful of CG scenes that might not have aged brilliantly, the only real criticism I have of these movies, the only one, and it's only a very minor issue, is that these movies contain a lot of what I call bathhouse lines. And by that I mean moments where characters will talk aloud to themselves for the sake of a brain-dead audience. And I call them bathhouse lines because the one example that always sticks in my head is in Spirited Away, when Chihiro looks at the bathhouse. And in the original Japanese version, she just looks at it. But in the English dub, they thought, hey, the people in the West are going to be too stupid to know what this building is, so we'll just have her say it out loud to no one. It's a bathhouse. You see what I mean? Bathhouse. What is it? What do you smell? Man flesh. It's all right, guys, we remember Aragorn. We know that guy, right? You know, scraggly beard, long hair, strider, Isildur's hair. Yeah, we, we know that guy. It's okay, you, you don't have to tell us. And on to Edoras, which is half CG, half real, but the real half they made is one of the most impressive practical sets I've seen for a movie ever. The entire top section of the settlement was actually built on top of a mound with fully furnished interiors. Just unbelievable lengths to go to, but things like that really did pay dividends. Gandalf the White, Gandalf the Fool. And if you wanted another anecdote concerning the effort that went into these movies, the guy responsible for making all of the chainmail that you see on screen was making this armor for about two years straight and spent so long hand joining it all together, he ended up wearing out his fingerprints. I can remember when Mordavith Clark needed counseling because she didn't like filming scenes where other actors were holding prop swords. <laughs> Meanwhile, this guy ended up without fingertips. At least he could steal a bunch of props from set and no one would know it's him. Silver linings and all. And then on to what is one of my favorite sequences from the entire trilogy, and that is Helm's Deep. I remember watching this as a kid and it just blowing my microscopic little kid brain. The build up, the payoff, it, it's so good. It all seems lost right before battle and then the elves show up. I mean, it didn't happen in the box, and I guess it kind of makes the War of the Last Alliance the second to last war of the penultimate alliance, which, which obviously doesn't have quite the same ring to it. You know, I, I thought it was kind of cool. You get to see the, the armor, the elven armor, the swords, the... I thought it was kind of cool. Just saying. Another part that some fans were a little disgruntled with was some of the more flamboyant 
acrobatics, particularly pertaining to our elven friend Legolas. Particularly the shield serpent scene, you know, when he's going down the stairs like, kapew, kapew, kapew. Like, I, again, I thought it was really cool. I really liked it. And I'm not sorry. And on to Return of the King, and we'll start with the death of Saruman. Now, this scene, I believe, was taken out of the theatrical cuts. And there's a funny story that goes along with this, because, obviously, Saruman is both physically and metaphorically stabbed in the back by Wormtongue. And whilst Peter was trying to direct Christopher Lee during this scene, Christopher Lee apparently looks at Peter Jackson and he says, Do you know what sound a man makes when he's stabbed in the back? And Peter's like, uh, uh, no, uh, no, not really. And Christopher Lee's like, well, I do. <laughs> so, so Pete's like, all right, yeah, leave it up to you. Because it turns out Christopher Lee, not only a badass on screen, but off screen as well. Turns out he was a, uh, a commando during World War II. So, you know, he, he probably saw some shit. And on a completely random side note, just wanted to share this meme that I saw earlier on today. It's a, it's a picture of Sam and it says, uh, defeated Shelob, an immortal creature that even Sauron knew to leave alone, carried the one ring and gave it up willingly. Stayed by Frodo until the very end, to assure his quest was complete. Went back home and slammed Prime Hobbitussy and had 14 children. <laughs> Has there ever been a side character as based? No. No, there hasn't. I love the mix of techniques these movies used. It, you know, in some cases, they spent years building these gargantuan sets, handcrafting thousands of pieces of armor and weapons. But then, at the same time, they use some of the most basic filming techniques there are. Take the Hobbits, for example. To get them looking the correct size when on screen with certain characters, sometimes they just have them <laughs> kneeling down behind a wall. <laughs> it's like the most low-tech solution there is. But hey, you know, it works. And for me, one of the single coolest pieces of design throughout the entire trilogy is the Witch King of Angmar, particularly with the fell beast. Like, that helmet he wears too, which actually was changed because people were worried that he'd look a bit too much like Sauron and people are getting confused. But the new crown, so dope. It's sort of halfway between a crown of thorns and the seal of Akatosh. It looks fucking awesome. But it makes sense that he would look so incredibly badass because for a character with very little screen time that says almost nothing, it's important that his design screams in position. You know, the way he looks does the talking. And I like the conversation. Here's another fun fact. The lad handing out spears in this scene is actually Tolkien's great-grandson. Yeah, the, the Tolkien estate weren't the biggest fans of the movies, except for his great-grandson, Royd, who watched The Fellowship and The Two Towers, and having enjoyed them so much, he rang up Peter Jackson and said, you know, hey, do you mind if I come check out you know, the return of the king. And Pete was like, sure, want to be in it? <laughs> so he was like, yeah, go on then. Christopher Tolkien, however, Tolkien's son, not quite the same story. Uh, if I can remember, you know, I can't remember exactly what it is that he said, but he said something along the lines of, the Peter Jackson trilogy eviscerated the books in order to make a bunch of action movies for teenagers. <laughs> he said something along those lines. And uh, look, Christopher Tolkien is and was a much bigger authority on anything Tolkien than I am. But to call the Peter Jackson trilogy just a bunch of action movies for teenagers, uh, yeah, you know, not really doing them justice. Now, if Christopher Tolkien thought that the Peter Jackson trilogy was bad, Lord knows what he would have thought about Rings of Power. <laughs> Now, Chris Tolkien passed away in 2020, so he never ended up seeing the release of The Rings of Power. And to be honest, even if he didn't die, this show would have definitely finished him off. And let's talk about Dunharrow. I don't really know what it is, but I always wanted to be a part of this scene when I watched this growing up. Just, just the thought of camping with the boys before riding into battle. What's better than this? Guys being dudes. I, I've lost count of the amount of times I've watched the trilogy, but every time I do, I forget how many badass scenes there are in these movies. Elrond handing over the newly reforged Anduril to Aragorn, I mean, that, that's just, that's a cool boner right there. Although the vast majority of these movies is shot practically, there are a number of CG shots, which have aged <laughs> okay. I mean, better than you might think. To be honest, like, the CG in these movies isn't bad, it's just old. There is a difference. But I think the CG work that's aged better than most is the Army of the Dead. They still look incredible, even by today's standards. They look really, really good. It's probably down to the fact that it's manipulated live action footage rather than raw CG, sure, but it still looks fantastic. Also, one of the producers asked Peter Jackson during this scene why there's only skulls and not other bones, like arms and legs, and Peter Jackson just said, oh, uh, oh yeah. <laughs> 
Also, as some of the final shots for the extended version of The Return of the King were shot so late on, the movie actually ended up winning an Academy Award before they'd even technically finished filming it. To win an Academy Award is an impressive feat. Well, I mean, it used to be. It's a little more oppressive these days, but that's a, that's a topic for another video. It used to be impressive, though, and to win one for a movie you've not even finished filming yet, I mean, that's something else. And of course, one of the most epic scenes from modern cinema and that is the ride of the Rahirim. And I personally consider this to be the true climax of the trilogy. Not the ring being destroyed, not the eagles. I've always felt that this was the real emotional zenith. When the tide first starts to turn, and it does so with a great wave of horsemen. Also, for the safety of the riders within this scene, they spent days scouring the field where they were going to film this scene, making sure that there weren't any rabbit holes, because obviously, if a horse trips over during a charge like this, all of a sudden you've got a very expensive and very painful pileup. So, to avoid anyone or any horse getting hurt, they scoured the fields. You see, Amazon? That's how you look after our Equus friends. Hashtag Rings of Power killed a horse. That's actually not a joke, they really did kill a horse. Now bear with me, because I'm about to put my Lord of the Rings tinfoil hat on. This might be copium, but allow me to cope for just a minute. Hear me out. Because I've spent many an hour watching the movies. I've spent many an hour watching the makings of The Lord of the Rings. In fact, I've probably spent more time watching the makings of The Lord of the Rings than I have The Lord of the Rings. But anyway, I've also watched the commentaries a couple of times. And one thing I noticed about the Peter Jackson commentary is that throughout the trilogy, throughout the 12, 12 or so hours, he mentions the 25th anniversary a number of times. Maybe it's just an in-joke. Maybe it didn't mean anything. But the fact is, it was mentioned multiple times throughout the three movies. Like, more than 10 times he probably mentioned this 25th anniversary and what to do for the 25th anniversary. And a number of times he's talking about a scene that wasn't even included in the extended cuts and he says something along the lines of, oh, we could, uh, we could throw that into the, uh, the 25th anniversary release. Now, like I say, this could be copium. It could have just been a joke. But the fact is, in 2026, there is a small possibility that we'll receive an even more extended version of the extended trilogy. Can you imagine getting to rewatch the trilogy, not knowing when a new scene was about to pop up? Would that not be the greatest movie marathon of all time? Like I say, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Now, if you were around on the early days of YouTube, and when I say early days of YouTube, I mean the early days of YouTube, you remember that some of the earliest YouTube memes was Lord of the Rings remixes. They're taking the Hobbits to Isengard was uploaded 17 years ago. Yeah, the crazy thing is, I can remember that being a new video. <laughs> I would have been like, I would have been like 10 years old. God damn. You would have an easy time telling me that these movies are not your favorite movies of all time. That's fine, that's your opinion. But you would have a Herculean task convincing me that these are not the most well-made movies ever made, period, not even close. I will say that we can't or shouldn't hold all movies to the same standards as the Peter Jackson trilogy. You know, this was just one of those one in a million lightning in a bottle moments. I think it would be unfair to do so. But one thing we can do is we can hold all movies and TV shows to the same standards that this trilogy set when it comes to the level of care and respect when it comes to movie making and the source material. In this case, the books of Tolkien. I appreciate you watching this video. I'll catch you in the next one. And as always, a big shout out to The Fellowship. The patrons and the channel members, we have the top tiers, Flunky, Pozzabon, Infinite Dum Dum, David, Jax, Koss, Michael Terpia, Texas Sawman, ATS, Dagger D69, nice, Saint Nemo, Steve the Goat, Michael, Digitally XE, and Nostagmus. To you, the Knights of Law, I thank you for your service. And of course we have the tier twos, Saeed, Dr. Malski, Yonwich, Hadzu, Canon Dog Romachi, Mark Maiden, Sensei Bang, Mandicum Bias, Agent MO62, Michael S, Rich Walwick, Kidnap Tiger, Michael and Jarek, and the Grand Admiral. And we are also welcoming Stu Cheeks, Incredible name, my friend. And McLegend Face. I'm sure your face certainly is legendary. Thank you to the both of you for joining the tier two. It's very good to have you. And of course, a big thank you to each one of the tier ones. Sean Blackman, welcome to the tier one, my friend. To each and every one of you on this list, it's incredibly humbling, the uh, level of support that you show me. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. And there we go, another day, another video. Will you join me for my next one? You better do, you little bitch. But until then, take care of yourselves, guys, and I'll see you 
very soon. You know, there's not a whole lot I can say about that other than what the fact that there's a helicopter currently flying over the house. I'll wait, I'll wait. It's probably something really inconsiderate, like a, an air ambulance or something.